uh, join us. Uh, so we've started our recording. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our eighth and final solid waste work group session. For those joining and observing us this evening, I am Stacy Rogers, and I have the pleasure of serving as Baltimore County Administrative Officer and Chair of the Solid uh, Waste Work Group. Since November, we have heard from numerous, numerous industry experts on disposal, collection, diversion of solid waste. We have learned, at least I know I have, a tremendous amount through this process. And I wanna start by thanking all members of the work group for your participation, your due diligence in responding, um, your questions, your thoughtful questions, and your responses to the briefing memos that have been provided for your input. Before I get begin with this evening's uh, session and turn it over to uh, our very, very capable project manager. I would like to do a few housekeeping, uh, uh, give a couple house housekeeping um, reminders. Again, our session this evening is being recorded. The materials that we will review tonight, work group members you should have received earlier uh, in the week, and they were sent from uh, Jennifer Porter, our project manager from GBB. I hope that everyone had the opportunity to receive and review the information. The WebEdge chat function will be available this evening for use by our work group members. Again, this chat function is for use by our work group members only. Work group members, please note that as we have done in uh, prior work group meetings, we will continue to have designated time throughout the session for discussion and questions. For work group members on camera, if you would please kindly uh, raise your hand and we will acknowledge you for questions and comments that you may want to make uh, throughout our session. To our observing participants, please note that if you have questions or feedback throughout the meeting, please send them to the county's email work address. We are unable to respond to anything that you place in the chat. We need to have your responses sent through the email, the county email um, address. We'll make every effort to respond to your uh, questions. That email address is solid waste work group at Baltimore County MD.gov. Again, that email address is solid waste work group at Baltimore County MD.gov. Thank you for your cooperation uh, in those announcements. Tonight, at the conclusion of our meeting, our, our first hour of our meeting uh, is dedicated to reviewing our preliminary recommendations that we will forward to the county uh, executive for his consideration. Once we complete that uh, process, we will shift to a community, uh, a public comment period. So after the first hour of this session, we will shift to a community public comment period. Uh, participants in the public comment period registered, and I'm pleased to announce that we have 49 individuals who have registered. So um, work group members, at two minutes apiece, that does mean that we will be here longer than our, our typical 7 p.m. two hour meeting, but we wanted to give every opportunity for the public to 
participate. After our meeting, if anyone has questions or comments, please do not hesitate to send them to, to the Solid Waste Work Group at BaltimoreCountyMD.gov. Uh, Ms. Peoples will be facilitating the public comment period and will give uh, further instruction when we get to that portion of our meeting this evening. Tonight, we will review our preliminary recommendations, after which um, Jennifer will provide us with uh, directions for completing our work group member prioritization poll that will be due as discussed next Wednesday, March the 10th. We will also receive next steps for uh, participation and uh, review of the final document before submission to the county executive. Again, we've received a lot of information thus far, and we will receive more information this evening from our uh, from members of the the public. Please take this information into consideration when you complete your uh, prioritization polls later this uh, week or it, by Wednesday of next week. I would like to remind everyone that we want to ensure that our recommendations are a part of the are part of the consideration that our survey data, our presentations from industry experts, and again, feedback from members of the public tonight should be taken into consideration for our um, prioritization polls. We will also do our recommendations in a two-part process. We're going to focus on interim recommendations that we believe should begin within uh, our next fiscal year, which begins July, 2021. And then our final document will be due to the county executive in mid-April. Again, uh, those recommendations that uh, will have fiscal implications this coming fiscal year, we will prioritize as our interim, interim recommendations. Those will be given to the CE uh, and focused on here uh, in March so that we can ensure that they get into the budget deliberation uh, process and are a part of our budget FY22 budget submission that the county executive will uh, give to county council in April. So I am uh, going to stop there. If there are questions, please feel free to let us know. You can again, um, work group members uh, put those in the chat and we will answer them when we get to our first break in terms of questions. But I'd like to turn it over to Jennifer to start our review of the preliminary recommendations. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. So excited to be here tonight with everybody and uh, share the proposed strategies for the tactical plan. Um, I am here tonight with GBB as a project principal and project manager. We've had a number of uh, GBB staff and EA, the engineering science and technology firm on this project. And with me tonight to present, I wanted to just do briefly introductions um, as myself, uh, principal on this project and have been, I'm gonna be speaking tonight on some of the uh, waste reduction and zero waste efforts. So I wanted to note my SWANA certification in zero waste practices, uh, principles and practices. Is also former program uh, coordinator in the city of Portland and been a number of projects with GBB. 
Steve Simmons, our president, will be presenting tonight also um, focusing on the technology and his experience in the uh, processing technology and uh, extensive uh, fiscal analysis. So glad to have Steve Simmons here tonight. Also, Harvey Gershman, a founder, owner, associate with GBB with more than 40 uh, years of experience and a lot of uh, relevant experience in the region in particular, uh, leading many multiple uh, long term planning efforts and glad to have Harvey presenting and it was part of the hauler subgroup breakout effort as well on this project, along with Sam Librand, our principal associate. Uh, more than three decades of experience in the consulting and private sector uh, with collections and operations and uh, very familiar with Baltimore County's system even prior to the project. So I'm, I'm glad to uh, be here with my colleagues. Our agenda, which we are uh, following tonight is the same as what you had in the uh, was posted and we are on track with that. And as Ms. Rogers said, we'll have public comments after our presentation of the strategies. Uh, we've covered the inputs to inform decision making. Just again, we've been through quite a process in the last five months and glad to be at this point of uh, framing the tactical plan. No comments. Um, are there comments on the last meeting notes or files that were sent? Just take a moment to ask if anyone has any comments or questions there for the work group. Not seeing anything. Okay. We had a lot of files sent. I wanted to say just appreciation again to everybody for the amount of information, as Ms. Rogers said, staying on top of all of the, the files and correspondence. Really do appreciate that. So our tactical plan strategies as presented in your prep materials for tonight are broken up into five uh, categories and we're going to cover them in these categories. There are 19 strategies, um, many of which we covered at last meeting, but there's been some refinement. Uh, the other thing I wanted to note is for the most part, this PowerPoint presents exactly what you got on Tuesday as the work group, but there have been some modifications. Um, on a few language pieces and the speakers will point out any changes related to slides um, as needed, but uh, we'll, we'll get to that as we move through. So our framework, just as a reminder that we're working on a center piece here of less, less waste, more inclusive and livable and vibrant Baltimore County. This framework will be uh, represented in our final tactical plan. And as we've endeavored to look at each ring and propose strategies, this has been an organizing uh, piece for us. We've looked at elements for consideration along these lines. And again, I put these in to remind us of where we've been. It's been a lot of work that this group has done together. And we have looked at this as well in our past meetings, our sustainable materials management hierarchy and in thinking about um, trying to move further up the hierarchy to uh, prevention and redesign uh, reduction as much as possible. In terms of zero waste for Baltimore County, the group has uh, determined the, our, our, def, our working definition of it, including reduced reuse materials, increased recycling and sustainability lens for what's left. And you'll see this demarcation up on the slide as we move through the 19 strategies, any that have been specifically designated zero waste strategies will have that green marker on it. And in your prep materials, they were also indicated uh, with, with a notation. So just gonna pause for a moment before we go into the strategies and see if there's any comments or questions happening. Does anybody see anything? I can't see the chat. So are we okay to keep going? Okay. We are going to, um, unless someone wants to say anything. Jennifer, I do have one thing. I just want to, again, if you go back to the zero waste slide for a moment, I just want to emphasize that uh, we have continued to consider what zero waste means here in Baltimore County. Uh, reflected on this slide is how we are operating. I acknowledge and I want to thank members of the public who have 
sent information, uh, background, lots of other information about uh, zero waste. And as we go forward, once our recommendations are uh, considered by the CE, there is ample opportunity for us to uh, continue to look at zero waste. But this is what uh, zero waste from the approach here in the county represents for us. And I believe that we have adequately reflected in our recommendations what zero waste uh, efforts going to, towards zero waste means here in Baltimore County. Because as I think Sarah so aptly stated, or I know in one of our meetings it was stated that the definition of, of zero waste and how it is approached is very, very um, tailored toward the jurisdiction. Sarah, did I get that right? Yes, you did, thank you. Okay. All right, I just wanted to acknowledge that because we have received lots of information about zero waste from numerous people and we've tried to address that. But this is not the end of our discussion in terms of zero waste. Mm -hmm. um, there's opportunity in the future as to what that means, but I want everyone to note what it means to us. Anything else? Okay. So we are now going to move into our presentation of the 19 strategies. And as noted, we're going to start with the first uh, grouping, which is the collection uh, grouping. Yeah. And one other note. Um, uh, work group members, I hope that the manner in which you receive the one pagers with all of the the um, considerations in one place <laughs> uh, to review the, the time frames, the fiscal piece and the narratives and how that relates back to other parts of the, the uh, narrative and to the county's enterprise wide strategic plan. I just want to acknowledge the hard work uh, that went into preparing uh those um briefing documents for each and every one of these recommendations uh it went from uh 18 to 19 because we the county requested that the um uh plastic bag ban on recycling we wanted that to be a standalone recommendation that's how we went when we talked uh the last time we were together it was 18 and it went to 19 uh, that was how it went to 19 because we requested the plastic bag ban to be a separate standalone um, uh, recommendation. Okay. Okay, thank you. Sam? Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, the first recommendation pertaining to collection would be the establishment. Sam, we're going to get a little closer. Get a little closer, maybe. Okay, hold on. Um, good evening, everybody. I, uh, the first recommendation pertaining to collection services is to implement the established uh, five service agreement with current haulers. It would also consist of studying the current yard uh, waste material collection routes, seeing if they can be improved or changed or should be changed. Review the collection of yard waste material, se seasonal, weekly, bi weekly. Try to address that, determine what is best for the best practice for the county. The benefits of the five year agreement are there will be equipment and insurance and service requirements that are specified. Uh, yard, yard waste material collection practices would be spe clearly spelled out and specified. And the, the agreements would be assignable with uh, county approval should any of the haulers decide to sell their business. It also, although it's not stated here, provides a level of security to the county that those services will continue un, uninterrupted. And it provides some security to the haulers also. In order to move forward with this, you'd have the county would have to establish a budgetary pra practice to adopt the uh, service agreements, uh, provide uh, updates on the uses of plastic bags and its change to paper craft bags as 
the next slide will talk will recommend and then uh, see what changes need to be uh, completed with the county's current yard waste uh, excuse me solid waste regulations now there are costs to all this uh, one the, the first cost significant cost would occur in fiscal year 22 about one two 1.2 million dollars for the addition of tippers to the current haulers trucks in order to use the use rolling carts instead of the var various different uh, carts and containers that are used currently. Now 2.1 million for to establish to address the yard waste compensation and make sure that it, it actually matches the level of service that's required. And 2.6 million for trash and recycling sort of collection services in order to provide the additional compensation to the haulers that meets kind of a minimum stand industry standard. And about $100,000 for advisors or assistance with implementing the program, since it is quite a big program. To them. So that is the first strategy. And as I said, it ties into the next one, next strategy. Consider the elimination of plastic bags for yard collection of yard waste materials. Currently, there are a lot of plastic bags, yard waste materials collected in plastic bags quite frequently. And it, it results in existing additional contamination of uh, yard waste when it's processed into mulch, additional cost, uh, you know, and uh, actual residue. So you, you would have to establish a public education and communication program to explain the change, have to support the haulers with the change so that they uh, are not placed in a situation of uh, having not providing the service the county is, the residents are providing. You'd have to put benefits would be revenue increases for the haulers, contamination reduction, which is a large, uh, a very good benefit. And the yard waste processing costs would be reduced because you don't have to worry about removing the plastic bags. Policy and legislation that would have to be adapted. You'd have to establish a budgetary practice to, to support the practice. And plastic bag policy updates and communications as to when they, they would be phased out and what they would need to be replaced with. The operating costs for or development costs for such a program are indicated to the right of the slide. Fiscal year 22, about $50,000 is estimated, and then 35 for the following fiscal year 24, 23 and 25 for fiscal year 24, essentially reflecting some reduced costs once the program is actually established and in place. Another strategy would be to provide the haulers with some tech collection technology. Techno technology has advanced significantly over the past two decades to make um, solid waste collection a really uh, very uh, technical part of, provide a very technical a component to it. They provide what the county would do is provide the haulers with information and training concerning new systems, provide technical assistance in changing operations and equipment. Some of the benefits are potential cost reductions collection, less greenhouse gas generation because of more efficient routing, uh, more efficient collection routes, so less fuel being burned also, reduction of customer service issues. Uh, policy legislation that would have to be in, utilized. Uh, adequate funding funding would have to be needed would be needed in-house personal or subcontract needed to support the program since it would be a technical program uh, the initial some of the operating costs would initially be 70 about seventy thousand dollars to establish the program uh, one hundred fifty thousand to further support it the following year and uh, develop routing options for the designated collection areas and then support the haulers with impl implementing those routing options. From that point on, it's assumed that the county would have a full-time equivalent added to uh, the current st organizational structure in order to maintain the program. And it's reflected in those costs are reflected in the, the following fiscal years of fiscal year 24 through 26. And consider the use of recycling carts. 64, 96 gallons, depending on what is uh, determined to be the best option. Seeking to try to obtain a grant from the recycling partnership, which is quite possible. Hire a se separate supply and maintenance contractor to actually maintain the carts, distribute them, distribute the carts, and track them. 
Uh, the benefits would be a revenue increase, a cost reduction in contamination of the processing of the reflective recyclables, landfill life extension because it's estimated that when proper recycle, uh, rolling carts are provided for these programs, you can increase significantly the amount of recyclables that are actually collected and reduce contamination. And this would result, of course, the land extension of the land um, eastern sanitary landfill to life and less greenhouse gas generation. Some of the budgetary policy legislation, you have to adopt budgetary practices to support the program and hire a, um, a maintenance replacement and storage contractor along with the policy and procedures to uh, support the program. And there would be a full-time equivalent to manage that. That would be needed to manage that program. And, and Sam, may I ask you before you go to the next one? Sure. Mm -hmm. Similar to what Baltimore City uh, is operating uh, currently, and as far as the uh, grant, uh, Baltimore City, there was a, a uh, press release about Baltimore City's uh, partnership with the Recycling Partnership. So we know that um, at least our one of our closest neighbors has a similar program. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you, Stacey. I actually should have mentioned that there would be some additional costs, obviously, for implementing the program in fiscal year 22. And uh, capital costs, you'd have to purchase the actual containers. And then you'd have to maintain the containers once uh, they're in place. And those costs are reflected in the different fiscal years components of the slide. Mm -hmm. uh, one other, another strategy would be uh, consider several uh, pilot projects. The purpose of the pilot projects are they allow the county to evaluate different op service options, determine what are considered to be uh, favorable for the county, and establish a service platform and model to proceed should you wish to implement them throughout the county. One project, uh, pilot project that's to be considered about 5,000 to 10,000 dwellings, same day collection of recyclables and, and trash, new recycling carts, including implementing, uh, installing tippers on the back of the haulers trucks so that they can utilize the rolling carts properly. Another service project, uh, pilot project for consideration is for five to 10,000 uh, residents uh, dwellings, same day collection of all weight of recyclable and um, solid waste or trash, cart for each material, food scrap waste with yard materials and organics carts, and consider fully automated. If you can go to a fully uh, an area where you can implement a fully automated service. There's significant reductions of cost and a much safer uh, collection environment for the employees and for the community. Third, uh, third project, uh, pilot project would be uh, the collection of food scraps outside, only outside the bird and where no yard collection, waste collection is currently conducted. The cost for, for this program would be estimated to be fiscal year 22 about fifty thousand dollars in operating costs just to kind of plan out the implementation of the programs. One to two, one point two to two point four million, four million for capital costs pertaining to the carts, and then fifty thousand dollars, about fifty thousand dollars for fiscal year twenty three and and twenty five and twenty four, just to follow the program and manage the program. You probably want to establish a full time equivalent in the in the or a position such as a project manager in order to manage the projects and analyze the projects to determine uh, how they are doing for the county. This, this, new service, this is Harvey Gershman speaking now. Uh, this new service would be for collecting bulky materials. Including mattresses. And People go on mute if they're, it's a lot of background noise. Okay. Let me start over. This new service would be for collecting bulky materials, including mattresses, in a manner that would allow them to be reused, repaired, recycled as much as possible and not just wasted. Collection services would be curbside for residences and at convenience centers. The collected materials would need to be triaged at county convenience centers and the good stuff loaded in trailers 
and delivered to nonprofit groups, private repair cafes, and other groups that are lined up to be part of this program and become involved in these new efforts. These groups will be supported with grants. Implementing this in phases should be considered in order to obtain data on the quantities and appropriate fees if fees are to be implemented. The indicated costs assume 10% of residential households get one collection per year and there is no charge for that collection. This service is estimated to result in approximately 600 tons per year diverted from disposal. Okay, the second new uh, service and program following Harvey's uh, bulk waste item, presentation on bulk waste item, is to consider zero waste education and outreach program. I think one of the more exciting, uh, or one of the most exciting presentations we had was from the North Carolina uh, Department of Environment and Natural Resources about the outreach program, which in, excited a lot of the uh, work group. And we've framed out a proposed zero waste education and outreach program, adding three proposed three full time equivalent staff to cover as you can read in more detail in the uh, program write up a number of, of programs, including uh, focused on residential and business uh, programs also incorporated into this is the backyard promotion of backyard composting and grass cycling. And on the composting backyard to also reflect uh, the addition of food waste, which would require a code change. Uh, but I would note if you think back to the presentation on the public survey responses that we had, which was one of our elements of building blocks of how we got to these strategies, there was interest in um, and in you know, actually of the people that said they managed yard materials, 22% did so in their backyard for the survey. So any case, a lot of interest there. Uh, in this strategy, we also have an expansion of the household hazardous waste collection hours, and as well as a number of other strategies. And as Ms. Rogers noted, we got a lot of input on this, this strategy from a uh, work group and public members and have incorporated much of that into the proposed strategy. There's increased, uh, in terms of benefits, there is um, lamp of life extension and greenhouse gas implications, many of which are reflected in the other strategies. For example, recycling carts, uh, we didn't double count uh, benefits, but this, this uh, outreach program supports the entire, um, the Bureau and the, the county's efforts overall. In terms of, uh, costs, we've estimated a range of 3 to $4 per household annually, um, escalated annually for the implementation of this program and the household hazardous waste number, the HHW number for the budget is a reflection of a doubling of what's currently spent on the household hazardous waste. So we have this uh, plotted for the five years of the tactical plan. Uh, Five year timeline, but expect that this is an ongoing um, investment that supports all of the programs. Good evening. Uh, this is Steve Simmons with GVB. So now we're going to switch over and talk uh, a little bit some considerations for infrastructure and disposal. Uh, the one of the primary assets the county has for the disposal of its non-recyclable waste is the Eastern Sanitary Landfill. And, and having a landfill within the county, within your system, provides you great uh, flexibility, resiliency in times of emergency. And so it's very desirable to maintain uh, capacity within your system. The Eastern Sanitary Landfill, though, while it served the county well for many years, is approaching the end of its permitted life. There's an estimated, depending upon various scenarios and, and options that are implemented, and we talked about waste reduction, somewhere around nominally 10 years or so of life left at the site. So we're going to talk later about some, some other long-term options, but extending the life of the landfill 
could be desirable. In this consideration, this option would be to extend the life of the landfill by beginning today to divert uh, some of the waste that's going into landfill to other permitted facilities. So it's transferring waste uh, to other locations. And we've looked at transferring up to 215,000 tons a year of your residential waste to other permitted facilities. In, in looking and surveying the market, we believe that as a budget would cost around $60 a ton for transportation and disposal expense. And so those are the costs that are reflected over here on the right uh, each year adjusted for inflation. So some of the benefits would be it would extend the life of the Eastern Sanitary Landfill. It could add six to nine years um, while the county made other provisions. On a greenhouse gas consideration, while greenhouse gas gases would go down in Eastern Sanitary Landfill, putting it in another facility, there will be greenhouse gas emissions there. So it could be a plus or a minus dependent upon the relative profile of uh, the disposal location versus uh, Eastern Sanitary Landfill. From a policy and legislative perspective, uh, you would need to do a procurement. And we would suggest a procurement open to all licensed facilities. And that's what would need to be put into place to execute this strategy. Next slide. Okay, in looking at some of the other longer term options, one option would, that the county could consider would be mixed waste processing. This is a, to, would be to build a facility, much like a material recovery facility that you have, just larger equipment, more robust, and it could accept mixed waste as delivered by the route trucks. We, through our work group meetings, we saw, had presentations from various technologies that are out there. This was just a sampling of what's available. But a facility like this could process additional recyclables that are inadvertently put into the disposal stream rather into the single stream bin. It could recover organics, food waste that were left in the disposal facility. And it would increase the county's overall diversion rate that way. So it could also be incorporated to include anaerobic digestion of the organics for production of renewable energy. The benefits would be, it would certainly extend the life of the landfills. We have seen business proposals from technology suppliers where they will guarantee uh, a 50% additional diversion from the landfill in communities that already have a single stream program. So you have your single stream, this would allow you to divert up to 50% or more of the waste that's left after the single stream reject uh, recycling. Certainly that along with that is less greenhouse gas emissions. You're diverting more, you're recycling, you're managing the organics outside of the landfill. It would create local jobs and provides, uh, it prov would provide the county with a food scrap recovery system other than a source separated. So it's a couple of ways of coming about that. This would be a long-term option. It's not something that's going to get built in three to five years of the tactical plan. But in the tactical plan, you could and would start to do feasibility studies of where could we site a facility? What kind of facility would we want? Is there an opportunity to do more of a regional facility? So that's what's going to be in the, in the five-year tactical plan is monies for doing studies. In looking in the long term from the from the proposals we've seen on other projects, these facilities would could have a capital cost from 100 to 250 million dollars. We've had uh, proposals from companies that would do totally private financing. It could be financed with uh, public money. There's a various options that can be put brought to forth to fund the capital costs. But that's the background of this this option. Going to the next. This one's not mine, is yeah, it? I'm a, yeah, that's me. I was, <laughs> okay. I was talking about there. Okay, infrastructure disposal category still. This is strategy number 10. 
to consider outsourcing organics processing to a third party for the pilot projects. This one is one that does look different than uh, what we we advanced this since the presentation to the work group uh, at meeting number seven. Upon evaluation of the uh, the current 13 acre site uh, that is currently processing mulch um, and looking at what would be the expected flow of organics from the pilot projects numbers two and three that Sam covered, we're looking at you know the outsourcing as a the recommended option for this you have a, a significant now if you look at the survey results on this though a small percent of people uh, asked or were interested relatively small were interested in food scrap many of them a high percentage of them were, were interested to pay for such a service and we do believe that with additional outreach related to just um, food scraps this interest could go up quite a bit and when you look at how much is disposed at ESL more than one third is organic material. So this is a significant opportunity as we are looking at ways to extend the life of ESL. This is a significant opportunity. What we have modeled in the cost that you see on the right is that outsourcing figure at um, to a third party processor for an expected 10,000 tons um, and at $50 a ton. So I would just note this this strategy also does tie into what we covered in the zero waste strategy about um, also promoting the backyard composting and the addition of uh, food scraps. But um, some of the uh, permitting changes obviously would be foregone uh, with the outsourcing option on the strategy. So we have modeled um, three years of this uh, program as uh, then, as we'll get to in terms of the long term collection program uh, would be coming in at the end of this and the, the learning from the pilot projects would be incorporated into that future uh, sort of long term collection strategy. Okay, option number 11 uh, to consider expanding the eastern sanitary landfill. Uh, as I indicated earlier, the landfill is coming to the end of its life somewhere in the next decade. And while that sounds a long ways off, that's not a long ways off when it comes to planning and constructing new disposal capacity. There's, there's no space at this site for a horizontal expansion. It's it's kind of hemmed in by wetlands. You you know there you can't go there. There's roads. There's development. So the only option for the eastern sanitary landfill site is to go vertical, in in what is called aptly a vertical expansion. Uh, there's various technologies that can can do that. They all include uh, building some walls around it so that you have to maintain the slopes and and there's all kinds of engineering things that go around it, but. Um, there's technologies that can go up. The landfill life could be extended significantly. Uh, it, you, through this and through the, the other options described, one could add, conceivably add somewhere between 11 and 48 years of life to this site. Uh, I would tell you, you know, if, if you're at 48 years, the site has grown a couple of hundred feet in height. So, it's not going to be tucked in behind someplace. It's going to be a very visible, prominent uh, feature in the landscape forever. Uh, some considerations in that, you know, the greenhouse gas, the visual impacts on the neighbors, the the total cost for construction would be somewhere between 63 and a half and 162 million dollars. That's not in the in the scope of the five-year tactical plan. In the scope of the five-year tactical plan. We have over here, as shown on the right, monies for engineering and design, permitting and advancing the overall project. Uh, for policy and legislation, it's a major permit modification. There will be a significant um, process to go through to get a vertical expansion of the Eastern Sanitary Landfill. Next slide. Mm -hmm. Um, going back here, uh, another strategy is to consider the uh, 
future planning for a location and design for the Western Acceptance Facility. One of the big issues with this facility currently, it is located in a floodplain and subject to plain flooding on a periodic basis, which is obviously not a good situation for solid waste management. You'd have to consider the use of general obligation bonds in order to acquire property and, and also then design and, and construct the facility. Benefits would be cost reduction in transportation and waste handling technique, uh, landfill life expense extension potential through if you were able to establish a site with rail access, you could ship material from there to other other landfills or permitted disposal sites uh, by rail, and that would generate a, a reduction in greenhouse gas uh, generation versus trucking. Some of the policy legislation that would have to be considered, a uh, project development plan with milestones would have to be developed, a uh, general obligation bond referendum to finance the purchase of property and construction of the facility, and you can evaluate other funding, potential funding options. Uh, it would be essentially just a more efficient way to handle yard. It would also provide the county with a more efficient way to handle uh, yard waste and single stream um, recyclables at this point in time. There are costs to it, about 300,000 in fiscal year two, 2022 in development costs and planning, 15, about 15.1 in fiscal year 23 to acquire property, $700,000 in permitting and design costs in fiscal year 24, then actual construction approximately 14.1 million is our current estimate. And then $100,000 for in fiscal year 26, just for um, managing the construction of uh, the facility. Another strategy currently, and Jennifer touched on this briefly uh, in the prior, one of the prior slides, is consider a yard waste transfer facility at the central acceptance facility. Purpose of doing that is currently the haulers from that, that service that area must transport the yard waste over to the Eastern Sanitary Landfill for processing. And those that, that, that results in more uh, road miles for the trucks, more generation of uh, greenhouse gases because of the transportation. But it would also allow the haulers to establish more efficient yard waste collection routes within the area of the central acceptance facility. Um, so what would have to be ha happen in order for this uh, recommendation to proceed would be the general, you'd have to uh, establish a rep, um, use whether you could use general oblig obligation bonds to finance the facility, the facility, and you'd want to quantify what the financial impact would be of making this change. There's about a hundred thousand dollars in the fiscal year 24 for basically planning and uh, design for the yard waste facility, then fi evaluating fine uh, financing options in fiscal year 23 then 2.5 to $4 million for the actual capital cost to construct the uh, transfer, uh, the yard waste transfer facility at the central acceptance facility. Okay, uh, going on now to, uh, you know, a very important uh, component of the county system is its material recovery facility. And somewhat to highlight the interconnectedness of all of these options is we spoke earlier about uh, getting carts, which have the very positive benefit of increasing the amount of recyclables set out for collection and processing. Uh, unfortunately, the county's current MRF doesn't have the capacity to process that additional volume. It's, it's full, it's tight, there's not really room to expand the facility, and it is approaching, um, it's, it's a mature facility, and it's starting to approach uh, the end of its useful life. It's full of technology that's 10 plus years old and is not a new modern MRF. So the county should consider several things for the MRF, its maintenance in future. Part of it is, is some, some maintenance work to just to help it work better now. But we do in the long run need a new MRF option. 
that could be a new standalone facility with room for expand the expanded facility, new technology, new technology can produce cleaner, better bales of commodities that are more readily accepted by the market. We could look at a regional kind of facility, or you could look at something that's done in combination with like the mixed waste processing system that we discussed earlier, which is really, um, it's a MRF and you can, you can incorporate uh, systems there. So the benefits of this facility would be extending the life of the landfill, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We've put over here on the right, some operating costs for processing the additional recyclables that could be collected with the carts at a third party uh, facility. Later, there's capital down in 2025 for an expanded or new material recovery facility. From the policy legislation, uh, you've got to have uh, capacity for the capital through the general bond ob obligations. Next. Now we've talked in the previous 14 options, a lot about costs. And, and I think a theme that has come through that a lot of these programs, while it brings the county system up to a more modern, sustainable system that everyone can be very proud of, it's going to cost more money. And there's a couple of considerations here on uh, getting a better handle on how much more money and how to fund that. Well, the, so the first option, option 15, is to take a look at, again, how you do the accounting for the Bureau of Solid Waste Management. Right now, it's accounted for, much like municipalities account for uh, departments, rather than as a business. And at times, it can be hard to track down, really, what is the total cost of collection when one considers trucks and maintenance or what is the county's total cost of processing organic waste. I think Mike Beachler has to have Excel spreadsheets over here on the side all the time going on really, you know, trying to get a, a handle on the total cost. So one would be to move the accounting, uh, the, the Bureau's uh, accounting system to more of a business-like accounting to where costs are fully known and projected. The benefits would be knowing better what your costs are. Uh, the policy, it just would, it requires the county to review its current full cost accounting and take steps to consider the impact of funding. Go on to the next. And then there's, there's new system funding mechanisms. Um, it's, it's widely considered a, a, a best practice across the industry in many bureaus or many locales that the solid waste department be set up more as what's called an enterprise fund, where the, the, the county or the, the fund, the system charges user fees to support the operation of the facility and the capital needs to continuously invest and improve the facility. Versus today, uh, all funding comes out of the general fund from the county. So we, we've recommended or think the county should consider moving towards a, uh, an enterprise fund system. This does have a lot of policy implications and would require possibly even uh, action at the state legislature to allow this. There are several of your adjoining counties that, in, that uh, use this, Montgomery County, Prince George's County, Hartford, Harford and Anne Arundel, I believe, all use system enterprise funding for uh, financing their system. So in the near term, for next year, what we've recommending or what is in for the consideration is, is simply money to study the cost and to prepare and decide, move, does the county want to move forward with establishing an enterprise funding system? Okay, uh, thanks, Steve. And our second, we have uh, our last uh, three strategies. We're going to touch on two more on financial contracts and move into a uh, final consideration. So uh, this strategy 17 is to consider regional collaboration uh, 
similar to what we had presented on this uh, slide last time. This is uh, regarding the existing entities working together in the additional information on this. We highlight some of the statewide legislation now, both um, Senate bills and House bills that are active. However, the recommendation coming forth through this is that regardless of the outcome of those um, initiatives, this, uh, the legislative initiatives, that this idea of regional collaboration is is good to think about, uh, could be, as we've talked about a number of the infrastructure needs that the county has, it could be advantageous to be looking at the existing entities that are regionally uh, thinking already, including the Northeast Maryland Waste Disposal Authority, which is um, supported and active on this project, MES, uh, the Maryland Clean Energy Center, uh, some of these we further outline, but in terms of, um, you know, thinking about that larger resource shed for material and capturing and marketing, it's important in this, especially with the amount of other infrastructure needs that we've already outlined. And we have a number of um, consulting costs related to the strategy on the right. Uh, this is strategy number 18. Now this one has changed uh, since uh, we spoke about it before. Um, the input from the, the hauler subgroup uh, was reviewed and considered, and as a result, uh, this strategy is has been written for the long-term uh, collection contracts to uh, be decided in a in a few years out, uh, rather than it being just competitively procured as was discussed last time. Uh, the recommendation here is to uh, look at both franchising approach and a competitive procurement um, after uh, the haulers are well into the service agreements and the pilots uh, to see how they're doing and to then be in a position to make a choice based on further discussions and further development of how these two different paths could be implemented in the county. Um, either way, the intent would be to provide preference for the current haulers in the county uh, through a number of ways, limiting the number of areas that could be awarded, setting aside specific areas for county-based haulers, requiring subcontracting with minority and or women-owned businesses is another approach. In this long term, the initial term of the of the franchise agreement or a contract would be 10 years so that the financing of new equipment that would be decided upon uh, for the services for the long term services could be financed uh, at a at a, a very uh, appropriate uh, term and rate. The, uh, the contract would also have extension terms included as part of it. The um, costs shown are, are consulting costs to help uh, the county go through the evaluation of these two options, development of the two options, and making a decision uh, in years three and four of the transition period, and then uh, having it implemented in year five, so it's ready to go in year six. <clears throat> this last uh, strategy relates to the Bureau's organization. Um, the Bureau needs to have an organizational review and be updated for what lies ahead. The current organization has over 50% of its workforce older than 50 years and about a quarter older than 60 years. Almost 20% of the workforce could require today. Additionally, there are 23 of the Bureau's 149 employee positions vacant. In addition, we're suggesting some additional FTEs be added to the organization for supporting the strategies we've just outlined. This review and adjustment will help the Bureau effectively and efficiently manage and administer the many changes that are likely to result from this tactical plan. 
The review and organizational adjustment is proposed to start next fiscal year and continue for several years as the tactical plan is implemented. Uh, these consulting costs shown are for outside assistance from a uh, HR consultant. Okay, so thank you. And we are now open for uh, work group questions and comments. May I make a comment? Yes, Councilman Potoka. Uh, thank you. I just, uh, as as you can see, that we aren't talking about minor tweaks in in our work group discussions in terms of how we're going to handle solid waste in the future. It's been an extremely comprehensive review, and I wanted to thank all of the members of the work group for digging in and spending many, many, many hours on this until we've got to this point. Um, I also want to thank uh, the participants that we have, the attendees today, because we have many, many attendees. So certainly um, there's, there's interest in this. What I have learned in my work with the Solid Waste Work Group, and I also learned this with the uh, Code Enforcement Work Group, that over the years, there hasn't been investment in these core functions of government but there has been disinvestment of these core functions of government. And so that's why we're in the situation we are in now is because we really haven't tended to these matters that really need attention because they're core functions of government. And so now we're at a point where we need to make these, um, these hard decisions rather than, uh, and, I, and I hate to use this expression because I believe it's overused, rather than kick the can down the road. But I really wanted to thank everybody, uh, especially the community reps, the stakeholders, uh, for spending so many hours in working towards addressing this very important issue. Thank you, thank you Council Member uh, Patoka. Um, I too have a couple comments. Again, uh, for those viewing um, this uh, discussion this evening, for each of the recommendations, the work group members did have an opportunity to receive a full briefing memo with background information, uh, observations, other uh, important pertinent information that was drawn from all of our various presentations and clearly from the uh, haulers perspective uh, from the sub work group. And I wanna really uh, thank the, the callers and again, members of the, the full work group, including council member Patoka, because you all did double duty in having uh, the, the second sub um, work group to talk through nuts and bolts about how on the residential collection side, this would work, how, how we envision this working. And I just wanted to acknowledge that we, it did, influence how the final proposed recommendations came uh, came to be, particularly the one on the long-term strategy in terms of contract. And we are indeed uh, exploring the franchise um, option, um, that the whole notion, uh, looking at what the uh, city, let me make sure I have it right, Jennifer, of Portland, mm -hmm. Uh, did in terms of the concept of franchising, which is a little different than we know when we think about franchising a corporate entity and someone gets a, 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 a part of that branded entity into perpetuity, but knowing that there are ways to address this and we are committed, I've said this over and over, uh, throughout this this endeavor that we are fully committed to working with our uh, existing haulers who have been with us for the long term uh, here in the county, uh, the the community surveys uh, presented, you know, data in terms of satisfaction, customer satisfaction uh, with the uh, service that they received. We have really good um, feedback from over 
was our final over 7,000. Yeah, right. Close to 7,000, right. 6,600 and some individuals who took the time to respond to the survey. So we've gotten that information. Uh, so a lot has gone into this. We are not taking this uh, lightly. Uh, the county executive has has committed to looking carefully at all of the recommendations. But as uh, Council Member Patoka indicated, this is the these things are very very expensive. If you see the projected uh, cost, but we are willing to make investments in our solid waste. Uh, program here in the county so that it is sustainable. Because one thing that was totally clear in this endeavor, I know I look at my trash differently and mm -hmm. we hope that through some of these efforts, our members of the community will look at the, what they throw away and how they dispose of things uh, more, um, you know, more carefully so we can divert some of the trash. Because th this is the reality, trash is never going to go away as <laughs> long as there are people that mm -hmm. that's the bottom reality bottom line reality and we are seeking to put in place put in motion a long-term strategy for managing solid waste here in baltimore county so i'll stop there because i know we had a question from one of our um work group members and, and this has this is uh from mr good um this is about um does the landfill accept bulky uh c and d waste at this time and if so what is the estimate tonnage per year um i would defer to mr beachler on that particular uh item we are trying to definitely get bulk items out of the landfill. That's the direction that, that we're headed. That's why we're seeking to have that very comprehensive uh, bulk pickup and then, you know, recycling mixing with it. It's not just picking it up and taking it to the landfill. It's like what can be feasibly done with what is picked up from um, bulk uh, pickup and then how do we recycle it or get it back into circulation where appropriate? Or like even the presentation on the mattresses, how do we dis, you know, um, you know, just recycle the various pieces which are usable? Yeah, but no, I thank refer you. To Mr. Beachler on the, the question that Mr. Good asked. Our C and D is construction and demolition waste, which is basically from building demolition. And yes, we do receive it because we are permitted for it. However, we have set our rate at $100 a ton. Adjacent to Eastern Sanitary Landfill is Days Cove Landfill, and just a few miles away is Honey Go Run Landfill. And you could take your C and D waste there for about $50 a ton. So we set our rate deliberately high, so we do not receive that, and companies send their material there. Uh, so we do get a little bit, but not much because there's other outlets. Okay, thank you, Mr. Beachman. And then um, Mr. Adams is asking a question about the number of budgeted uh, employees, and I would assume this is on the so, uh, solid waste side and the and the vacancies. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I, I think would... Matt, Matt Carpenter could speak to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's uh, 149 yep. positions in Mike's organization, and the slide had uh, the vacancies, uh, 23 vacancies right now. There are nine FTEs that are in included in all the strategies, so nine additional FTEs are estimated at this point. Mm -hmm. Concur with Harvey. Thank you, Harvey. Appreciate okay. that. I wanted to just share one more uh, view too for the work group. As you know, there was a lot that came out, but on this proposed strategies, there is a summary table uh, that you is the prior to the strategies that brings together. And at this point, they're not grouped in scenarios because we're asking for evaluation of each one uh, from your perspective now, but they are grouped like this. So if you haven't seen that, I would just point that out, especially as you uh, move to think about the poll. 
Um, could I ask about that a little bit, Jennifer? The yeah. um, because I'm looking at the capital cost versus the annual operating costs and particular to the infrastructure disposal options. Mm -hmm. um, the I feel like it would be really helpful to have like for example, if we had a lifetime on the mixed waste processing facility and and could compare things with a total projected sum of what because that um that capital cost is obviously large, but in theory it's going to be offsetting with some operating costs and you know what's your alternative? I feel like the operating cost or the the capital and maintenance costs for the now option like that's gonna again have like a like an end of the road period and i feel like when you go for 50 years if it's going to live that long like that new facility can last that long but and it's going to cost more up front but if it's if it's taking everything and diverting it appropriately like how do you evaluate that, that total cost to the county from any mm -hmm. of these facilities mm -hmm. If I could, uh, you know, one one way to look at it, maybe to answer your question in the, what well, was on the presentation slides, I believe in the the uh, briefing memos in the packet, we did say that this facility would have, uh, you know, expected tipping fee of somewhere seventy to ninety dollars a ton, that would include all capital, you know, amortization cost, uh, revenues, expenses. And that would compare to say the sixty dollars a ton that we we're saying that if you just wanted to transfer and dispose to a a licensed landfill today, mm -hmm. that's kind of the the upfront maybe comparison. Clearly, there's differences in the environmental impact, and that doesn't account for that. Uh, one would expect a much better environmental profile from a mixed waste processing facility than a landfill. But to your point, Kara, the uh, additionally, in, in addition to Steve's comment, is that we are um, want, wanting feedback on the strategies as we pull together what could be scenarios to group together because you you can't, um, you know, some of some of the identified strategies play together. So if you're looking at Western Acceptance Facility, you're looking at mixed waste processing, and you're looking at CAF transfer and, you know, the organics piece. I mean, a lot of these make sense. We have them kind of separated now because we don't know, we don't want to group everything together and then you can't disentangle well one from the other. So at this point they are separate, but you're right, they 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 definitely interplay. Yeah, well, because my my question started developing in my head back on the on the recycling carts. Like the recycling mm -hmm. carts, again are going to be an upfront cost, but if they're going to you know reduce, if they're going to increase the recycling and they're going to reduce the the use of the landfill, then the landfill you know the demand like it affects the lifetime. So if in long or you know in a, in a twenty year window, mm -hmm. those Really make a lot of sense, but like it's not. I, I just feel like we're selling a lot of the the green choices short by not really looking at if you just if you just divert or you know keep keep using the um, the existing. I, I think all the sustainable ones don't have any offsetting for like the burdens that they're relieving mm -hmm. financially in the analysis. Mm -hmm. Well. Um, let me ask the, a, a question, Kara. When you looked at the related um, in in the the summary documents, and you looked at the related uh, uh, recommendation, um, we be added a related recommendation in terms of how they uh, interrelate. Did you look mm -hmm. at those in in um, respect to um, your position? Because we were um, GBB tried to present a scenario. Well, if you do this, it is related to this act mm -hmm. from the standpoint of if you do one or the other, here's how it impacts the other. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I caught that on a, a few scenarios, just maybe not as many as I was expecting. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I do know that in when we get to what we're about to move to is the dis, the uh, discussion of how you put your prioritization together. There's in each one of the the 19 uh, recommendations, there is a narrative piece that you can mm -hmm. in because this is what's going to be the the longer uh, term because GBB will be working on our final report, if you will, that will be due in April. Mm -hmm. We have time to address some of those issues and maybe give some feedback uh, through um, communication, through email communication on each of those. But you could uh, surely write those kind of statements on the ones that uh, you feel like you need this uh, the additional comparative analysis to uh, make your decision. Noted. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Each one, each each uh, narrative, uh, one page or a multi pager mm -hmm. you know, that is tied to each recommendation. When you go into the the tool, you'll see a narrative, and I don't think it's it's limited to X number of characters. No, it's not a limit. It's, it's for you yeah. to give feedback on each one. Do any other okay, comments? Do you want me to do any uh any other um work group member uh comments before we uh transition? I'll I'll I can just touch on the poll if you want to, Stacy, Mr. Rogers, yeah, before let me, we go. Let okay. me check, let me let me check, check on the, the, the chat for a second and see if we have addressed uh, work group members. Is it possible that we will be locally legislated out? Uh, trying to see who that is. Well, let's go on while you- um, okay. you can, we can come back. Yes. Yeah. Could I uh, bring up something that I left in the chat box? Oh, yeah. uh, it has to do with recycling both the larger collection carts and the MRF. Mm -hmm. uh, it is true the larger collection cross carts will increase participation. They also tend to increase contamination. They're larger. Mm -hmm. They give people more of an option to throw in things that they're not sure whether or not it should be recycled. But hey, the cart is there. It's big. Let's just put it in. Uh, and, and I don't think that should be underestimated. Uh, secondly, if you're going to launch a whole slew of new carts without upgrading what is frankly a ancient MRF, you will overwhelm the MRF with uh, both increased material for recycling, but also increased materials that are going to be residue and will be sent to disposal. Uh, I I think that waiting until 2025 to rebuild the MRF is uh, very dicey at best. Uh, the best of my knowledge, this is a facility that does not have uh, even the rudiments of up-to-date technologies, whether it's robotic arms, artificial intelligence, uh, the various uh, light systems that can detect different materials. Uh, it needs to be replaced now, not in 2025. And especially if you're going to increase cart size and do a an improved job as, as every county needs to do on education, mm -hmm. you got to be ready for it. So, so Chaz, the um, extra tonnage in the strategy, the extra tonnage is, would be shipped to uh, another MRF for processing. So this MRF isn't overloaded. And one of the reasons, another reason for delaying the MRF decision is to see if it can be tied in with the mixed waste processing facility decision, which could take the single stream recyclables if it's, you know, uh, engineered in a way that allows for a clean stream to come in as well as the mixed waste. Uh, several facilities have been built that way. They work very well. And it uh, eliminates the need for two facilities uh, by having uh, it combine uh, functionality with the mixed waste processing facility. 
Well, I, I understand that argument. That's really the Montgomery County approach, which currently sends more of its recyclables to be processed in Pennsylvania than are actually processed in Montgomery County, which in terms of recycling is a horrible decision when you look at the greenhouse gas impact of shipping those recyclables that far to be to be processed. Secondly, mixed waste processing does not have a great record in North America. And to tie a new MERP to the potential for a mixed waste processing system sometime down the road, especially with the extraordinary range and projected cost for that mixed waste processing facility, uh, strikes me as being very risky. And you know what, uh, Mr. Miller, those are very, very good points. I would kind of ask if you will capture them in the narrative section for that recommendation so we collect everybody's uh, thoughts on that. This is in the priority poll uh, tool that, that we're using to capture everybody so we can put those in as, as consideration points. You know, there's pros and cons to piece of this. That's why we are saying to everyone, these are preliminary recommendations uh -huh. that we will have to make decisions about and the CE will have to guide us, uh, which by the way, he was listening in uh, for a while with us this evening. Okay. I, I agree totally with what you say. I, I have to admit, I was a little disappointed that for every strategy, there was a benefit, but no downside. But we'll add that. That's why we mm -hmm. want you all to mm -hmm. list the uh, uh, concerns or considerations that we should take, just like Kara's uh, mm -hmm. comment about the cost benefit piece and the interconnectivity. If you give it that, that feedback now on the preliminary, the 19, uh, and then we, we've extended that to Wednesday, close the business of, of next week, uh, particularly concerns that you have about a particular recommendation, we can capture that and add it because we do want to do that. The Ben Franklin T squared, that's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. uh, the pros and the cons, which we did a little bit of early on mm -hmm. with the um, briefing okay. memo when we went through the briefing memo, but now we're looking to you as, as our uh, work group experts, as subject matter experts to kind of crystallize that for us so that that can be placed in the narrative of the recommendations. Mm -hmm. Okay, I do see uh, Mr. Adams had a question. This was around, um, uh, I think it was uh, transfer. Mr. Adams, this last one, and then we definitely need to move on because we've got 49 colleagues out there <laughs> to talk to us tonight. Um, this is about the transfer, discuss landfill life and the idea of transferring, uh, say to King George's County, what is their expected life there? or other possible receptive landfills. I think we looked at, uh, at that. I asked a similar question when we were talking about it. Would they be receptive to taking, you know, our, uh, what we would want to transfer out? So I, I think we talked about that a little bit, but um, uh, Harvey or, yeah. or Sam or anyone, would you like to add a little bit of comment on that? And then we need to transition to talking about the tool and talking about our, um, you know, our homework with all of us have homework between now and Wednesday, then we need to get to our community colleagues who have uh, input for us to consider as well um, as we make the decisions on and respond to the priority poll uh, tool. Uh, I can take this, uh, you know, uh, we, 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 we didn't look for or look at specific landfills, but more rather said, look, the, the general market for this region is about $60 a ton. And there are multiple, multiple licensed facilities. So I'm certainly there will be some that will say we have no space or restricted out. But I, I think we have a high level of confidence that if the county were to do a public procurement that was open to, mm -hmm. you know, the marketplace, that they could acquire capacity at, at about that $60 per ton transfer and disposal cost all in. And I will say though, in our uh, pro and con, uh, Ben Franklin, T-square pro and con on that, 
we know the impact of the, the, the greenhouse gas emissions from the, the extended travel. You know, yes. we're, we're um, we talked, I, I think, um, um, it's the same as you talked about it a little bit in the presentation that that does have an impact. That will be in the document that that con here's the benefits, but here are the the mm -hmm. uh, other considerations from from the con side, the pro and con side, because I made note of that uh, myself as we go through these. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. All right. So colleagues, I'm going to um, ask Jennifer to shift to um, the, the homework directions, the homework assignment um for the 19 recommendations and what we need to do and use the the tool and then we will shift uh to uh the directions on hearing our public comments okay thank you uh we are going to issue the poll link uh this evening at the end of the meeting it will be due next wednesday we're moving into our interim recommendations this month and final plan in mid-april I wanted to share that what you're going to be asked to do for each of the strategies is uh, rank uh, either at the bottom here, do not advise. This is something you don't advise. It's a, a no impact or least desirable. Uh, then a prioritization, if it should be included to your opinion at a low, medium or high priority. So a low priority is uh, little impact in meeting the desired outcomes. It's um, you know, success is not as guaranteed and it's something that could be nice to do, where the medium priority is something that would meet the outcomes. It feels uh, that success is within reach and that it's a need to do. And then the high priority is something that is saying not only need to do, but need to do now that success is possible, it's important, and it's uh, within reach in the, the five years. So the this this is all going to be presented to you also in the poll itself, but we wanted to just cover what you're going to go through with each one. And as Ms. Rogers noted, there is space for you to provide comment on each and at the end as well. So there is uh, both the ranking and the uh, space for open comment. And you have your, your um summary page or the multi-pagers because first it was supposed to be two pages but then some of them have a little longer which I, I told to the group whatever will be helpful to the to us as work group members just put it in and so in each of the uh, 19 recommendations you will have um, this ranking to put it there's questions in there and then the rankings but what you will also have uh, what we ask you to kind of do is revisit um, the the summary of that recommendation, what's in the the document, and then in the open comment section, uh, list your concerns or questions, um, because the 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 cons will definitely be in in the document in the final document for the CE, because I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. A question, Jennifer, if I may. Yes is sure. how can we best capture um, what I'll just describe as sort of a combination of activities that seem to work together and if done as quote high priority would create the best outcome? Is it simply listing those two, three, seven things as high yeah. priority or is there another way to yeah. sort of demonstrate that in in tandem or in combination this would be the best way to proceed you can um note that as you in the comment uh for each tag and also you can go back you don't once you you can click the back button so you don't have to you know as you're going through you don't have to just you know you can still go back and edit an answer so you can make a comment um by the strategy number and also include that in the, your closing comments as you see how, how they could work together in scenarios, yes. Okay. And then Thank Steve, you. there's one other piece that we would note on each of the briefing documents, uh, GBB did try to connect ones that, that do go together. If you had the opportunity to look and see how they uh, 
go together and also uh, where it was um, uh, possible where it ties to some of our enterprise-wide strategic plan uh, efforts. They, they tried to tie some in, but I know mm -hmm. there are points for each of the sub areas, if there are four or five things, how, how do these things work in, in tandem in terms of, you know, going forward all at one time or, and how they work in tandem with the, the other recommendations. That's what I think I hear you saying. Mm -hmm. Well, it goes I'm back to Kara's point earlier about how these things interconnect. And if you're going to focus initially on education, what does that mean for recycling? And what does that mean for diversion? And also, you know, the other items. So that's fine. I got it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, sure. Okay, um, Jennifer, are there other directions you want to give the the uh, team? Are you going to show the the uh, the tool again? Because I know we looked at it. Or I'm I was just going to, for the sake of time, save it to email afterward. Unless okay, you so want to yeah. give written recommendations, and if there are questions, they can send them back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sure. All right. So the direction, further direction on the tool, but we looked at the tool at the last, uh, the last meeting, what the tool looked like mm -hmm. um, going through and where you could, you comment. Um, but if you have questions about the tool, um, please send them back to uh, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. I'll use the tool. Okay. So is Savitra going to give the instructions on those who are standing, presenting? Mm -hmm. Yes. Have we officially concluded um, this portion? Jennifer, is that? Uh, I believe, yes, I am concluded and yes. Okay, so uh, colleagues, we're going to transition to our public comment period. Uh, we actually had 50 individuals sign up and we were very uh, happy about that. One individual did write today to say that they were unable to participate. Uh, so we have 49 and Savitra is going to facilitate uh, this discussion, much like we do with the county council, um, um, giving individuals two minutes each to, to give their comments. So Savitra, we'll turn it over to you to move into that segment. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. So good evening. Um, we will now transition into the public comment period of the March 4th, 2021 Solid Waste Work Group Meeting. The public comment period is designed for members of the work group to receive input from the public rather than to provide immediate feedback to a question or comment that is presented this evening. At the conclusion of the public comment period, Final remarks will be provided by the chair of the work group, Ms. Stacy Rogers. This evening, as indicated, we have 49 members of the public who have registered to provide comment. A friendly reminder that each registrant will have two minutes to speak. For your convenience, we have a two minute timer that will be displayed on the screen. Speakers will also be reminded verbally once their time has expired. Please note that at the discretion of the work group chair, under appropriate circumstances, the allotted time may be reduced. To our registered public members, you will be called upon to present in the order in which you registered, beginning with the very first registrant. You will be acknowledged by your first and last name and unmuted when it is time for you to provide comment. Thereafter, your two minutes will begin. But before we, be, we'll, we begin, I would like to pause for any comments or remarks from our chair or work group members. I have none. All right, thank you. Um, if we could have the two minute timer on mm -hmm. the screen. Can you see it? Yes, yes. Okay. thank you. Mm -hmm. Now our presenters can, can see it too. 
Uh, Savitra, even if they've called in, they're, they're, view, they're able to view it as well? No, if they've called in, we'll have to alert them verbally once their two minutes have expired. Okay. All right, so I would now like to welcome our first registrant who, who will provide comments this evening. Jean Cushman. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, Jean, you may begin. My name is Jean Cushman. I'm a Towson resident. And thank you, Stacy Rogers and me, uh, Jennifer Porter and the SWWG for this public meeting. My main concern is climate change and its existential threat to my children and grandchildren and coming generations of humans on Earth. And I am opposed to the consideration of the anaerobic digesters, ADs, as seen on page 20 of the proposed strategies. This specific piece of the solution that SWWG considers is a dangerous one. Even the UK's pro-anaerobic digestion blog states the following concerns. Methane leaks, explosions, and the risk of asphyxiation to workers in confined spaces. I have done some research on this, and there are many accidents that are toxic to nearby homes and people working in or near the digesters. But with the 33.5 million tons of food going to landfills as waste, what can we do to stop this onslaught of GHGs? One option that I'm sure you will hear more about other speakers today is composting food waste. This is mentioned in the report as causing vermin and odor. But that's not true if it is done correctly and shouldn't be the thing that makes it the last option for our county. The problem with the so-called solution of methane digesters and landfills is all the required pipelines, the leakage of methane, the over-optimistic estimate of the amount of energy which would be generated, and all the infrastructure build-outs that will have to be maintained along with the possibility of explosions. And my, um, I've heard that these digesters are very hard to maintain and that sometimes they go down. Uh, I'm, for... I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, unfortunately, your two minutes has expired. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. All right, now we would like to welcome uh, Ms. Gloria Nelson. Gloria, you may begin. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and all. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Stacy. great seeing you. I yield, my two, I yield my two minutes to others because after looking at and reviewing the 19 strategies, my main issues have been uh, covered in your strategies. I also would like to comment on the zero waste for Baltimore County. I'm really very particular um, and concerned, interested in that as well as the um, bulk. So um, what my concerns are, they, as I mentioned, has already been covered in your strategies and I'm very pleased to see that. And I thank you all for all of your efforts and I yield the remainder of my time to others. Thank you, Gloria, always a pleasure. All right, now we would like to welcome Belen Ruggiero. Just one moment, Belen, and we will unmute you. All right, and your two minutes begins now. Hi, good evening. Thank you for the chance to speak to you today. My name is Belen Rogerio. I am a college student studying environmental policies. I was raised in Baltimore and I'm all too familiar with the trash problems plaguing the county. I grew up surrounded with clogged sewers, littered sidewalks, and polluted air. Therefore, I am urging you to consider including more zero waste options. Specifically, I'm requesting you place a higher priority on composting. Education and outreach are included in the plan, but strategies like increasing the county's capacity to accept more compost, as well as focusing efforts in big institutions like schools need to be included. Collecting organic materials from other waste separately is also important in maximizing efficiency. These will not only increase the county's diversion rate and reduce costs, but will generate jobs, provide fertile soil, and reduce the tons of greenhouse gases released by incinerators and landfills. This has already been done in several other Maryland counties with considerable success. 
Frederick Howard and Prince George counties have all incorporated robust programs with about 30% of their waste being compostable. <clears throat> One school in Frederick reduced their landfill waste by 88%. Imagine what could be done if all schools, homes, and offices have such a strong composting system. I know firsthand the difference that it makes. My high school did not compost, and every day by the time lunch was over, trash cans would be overflowing with food waste destined for the landfill. My college, on the other hand, has an active composting program, composting about 40,000 pounds of organic waste each month at a local farm who no longer has to buy fertilizer. So I urge you to please consider these options because reducing our dependence on landfills and incinerations is crucial to a more sustainable waste management system. As a young college student with hopes of a cleaner tomorrow, the decisions that are made today will impact the problems my generation will have to deal with in the future. Thank you so much, Ellen. No problem. Thank you for the chance to speak. Okay, next we will have Marie Laporte to provide comment. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. You may be well, um, So, so um, I wholeheartedly support um, the last person who spoke. I completely agree with her that we really need to be much more um, aggressive in trying to reduce our waste stream um, for the environment. So, um, but I actually, um, my primary thing, aside from concerns about recycling, um, where the recycling is not fully being utilized, um, is more pedestrian stuff. Um, it's we've experienced. I'm the head of our homeowners association in Chestnut Woods in Reisterstown, um, and I can say that on numerous occasions, um, trash cans are tossed in front of mailboxes, um, lids are tossed into the street, um, which blocks the the letter carrier from getting um, close to the mailboxes. Um, we frequently have missed pickups, um, even on days where the weather is really not terribly bad. Um, you know, it seems like here we cancel trash pickup if there's two inches of snow. And where I grew up in Chicago, we would go up to a foot of snow before school got canceled. Um, it's very frustrating for homeowners that they bring their stuff out um, and then they have to bring it back at the end of the day. In some cases, it's even coming very early in the morning before people have had an opportunity to bring it out. Um, and then um, lastly, sometimes they're just missing trash cans. They're just not even seeing them or they're not picking them up for reasons that we're not sure about. You know, what was um, objectionable about how the it was packaged that day. Um, and so I think there just needs to be more communication and clarity about um, mm -hmm. scheduling, cancellations that, that they're not going to be around, um, and what is objectionable for us to be putting out for um, residents. Thank you, ma'am. All right, next we have Elizabeth Libel. All right, Elizabeth, you are unmuted. Hi, this is Elizabeth Liebel. Thank you for the opportunity to give commentary today. I've been observing these work group meetings and I'm very happy that Baltimore County is taking this dive into its waste practices and exploring alternative options. Particularly good ideas that I've seen um, come from recommendations regarding the presentation we saw from North Carolina's Recycle Right program. I spent mm -hmm. a lot of last summer researching recycling and waste practices across the state of Maryland and found that it can be very, very difficult to find out exactly what's acceptable and the recycling rules from each county. So recycling just isn't taking place the way that it should. And I think implementing a program similar to that would be extremely beneficial. I'm also glad that zero waste initiatives are being taken into account as best practices, in my opinion, for waste management, start with creating less waste in the first place. Mm -hmm. I think that obviously education and outreach are important, but I'd like to see just kind of more specifically how that's gonna be taking place and where it'll be implemented. I am slightly concerned by the suggestion for a mixed waste processing facility. I just would like to know specific more specifics about that as well, just because if burning trash is included, then I don't know if it's something that I can support or that many people can support and processing trash into fuel that could be burned somewhere else instead of Baltimore County is not really 
something that I find acceptable either. Um, mm -hmm. That's it for me. So the rest of my time can go to someone else. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for your comments. All right, next we have Patrice Gallagher. Patrice, you are unmuted. Oh, you're unmuted. Okay, thank you. Um, congratulations to all of you on your hard work. I served on a steering committee of 10 citizens that our Frederick County Executive put together several years ago to make recommendations on handling waste here in Frederick County. Our process was different than yours, but our goal was very similar to try to figure out better and more sustainable ways to handle our waste. Frederick and Carroll County residents had fought off a joint incinerator project. So we already knew that our citizens were interested in less expensive and more sustainable solutions to our waste problem. We worked with an NMWDA consultant to study solutions that the steering committee and the public preferred. Early on, one of the consultants recommendations was a mixed waste processing facility, but the steering committee and the residents were clear that they did not want to pursue such an expensive option. It's really not needed if you pursue a real zero waste path, which diverts materials away from the landfill or other disposal. The upshot of the county study called for the county to begin with a robust organics diversion program with community composting centers throughout the county, three bin system for our residents and organics diversion for restaurants and other large producers. Also to start a program in schools so the habit and understanding of composting can be adopted from a very young age. Um, I would suggest that you take a more in-depth look at zero waste programs for your county and I'd urge you to talk to Ruth Abbey and her team at Ruth Abbey and Associates. She and her partners have worked on zero waste plans for Austin and Berkeley and other places and she and others on her team presented in Frederick twice in recent years. I thank you for this opportunity and I congratulate you on all of the efforts of your study group. You've done a very thorough job. Thank you. Ms. Gallagher, Gallag I just want to thank you. And we do have the, the links. Um, and that, uh, I don't know if you've seen the, the um, minutes from our last meeting with your a response to you, but we hope to continue to explore zero waste as we move, uh, move forward in our efforts. Thank you so much. It's great. Thank you. All right, next we have Justin Gallardo, who is going to be providing comment on behalf of Diane Whitner. Hello, right, can you Justin, hear me? Yes, you are now unmuted. All right, I'm speaking for Diane and I don't need to be number 39. Uh, as a Baltimore County taxpayer of 26 years and owner of Zero Waste Business Ecotopia, I thank you for addressing the issue of trash disposal. But I am concerned about the future pollution caused by plastic disposal or alternation resulting in toxic burning of waste. Will your waste disposal facility be an incinerator by another name? I respectfully purpose the following alter alternative zero waste path for transparency, economic to the taxpayers, environmental justice, and public health for all in Maryland. Institute pay as you throw policies across counties, creating 43% trash reduction consumer behavior as New Windsor's pilot program demonstrated over a two year period, implement consequential EPR or extended could extended producer responsibility and incentivize consumer sorting that reduces mixing or contamination of recyclable paper, cardboard, steel, and glass using lessons learned in Washington State, and develop multiple innovative hubs called Reduce, Reuse, Repair, Rot, and Recycle Row, building on Boulder, Colorado's holistic model located next to a public transit um, looking at the public transit for air pollution reduction, transport equity and convenience, rot or compost can reduce trash up to 34%, incentivize refill alternatives to single use plastics packaging and retails. I have done this with success 
with enthusiasm by returning customers at Ecotopia refill stations at Farmer's Market. The story of plastic taught us that plastic dependence, plastic waste disposal, and plastic recycling don't work. The steps above will actually create a pathway from trash waste disposal, single-use plastic packaging, and towards a cleaner Maryland. We can lead the nation on this. Let's do it. Thank you for your time. Justin, thank you so much. And you said it's oh, you're welcome. Ecotop Ecotopia is your company? Uh, that is Diane's company, correct? Oh, Diane's company is Ecotopia. Yes. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Next, we have Jennifer Kunze, who will be providing comments. Jennifer, you are now unmuted. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm Jennifer Kunze, the Maryland Program Manager at Clean Water Action. And I wanna thank everybody here for all the time and attention that you've given to this lengthy process. And I'm glad to see so much attention has been given to all of these recommendations, but especially recommendation seven for zero waste education and outreach. This and the connected strategies about composting should be top priority moving forward. And I'd like to see even more emphasis on composting within this plan. And for example, by having the county develop new yard waste and food scrap composting facilities by it for itself in the way that Prince George's County has done in partnership with MES, or to attract new businesses to build large composting facilities in the county, just like Key City Compost has done in Frederick. But like many of the callers tonight, I'm very concerned by recommendation nine, mixed waste processing, and I'd like to urge the work group members not to move forward with this. We didn't get um, as many details of, as have been discussed previously tonight about the scope of what this project could involve, but if it involves burning trash or processing trash to be burned, it's not something that I want to see Baltimore County invest millions and millions of dollars into that could be better spent on investing in large scale compost facilities and in programs to get unrecyclable materials out of the waste stream. And if we look at the budget, this is a lot of money. The material mixed waste facility is budgeted for $250 million in capital costs. And that contrasts to only $40 million in capital costs for um, the MRF recommendation. That's a big difference. And um, uh, in particular, I want to emphasize that composting is relatively low in capital costs um, and the solutions that eliminate and separate waste at the source aren't just the best ones for the environment and for public health, which they totally are, but they're also going to be what's best for Baltimore's County's budget. So please prioritize those and not a mixed waste recovery facility. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we will have Michelle Rockwell. Hello. You are now muted, yes. Hi, um, my name is Michelle Rockwell and I'm a resident of Baltimore City. I would like to thank the board for the opportunity to speak. I speak as both a fiscally minded individual and as someone who recognizes the urgent need for our state to employ zero waste strategies in order to effectively address the environmental crisis we're facing today. I'm disappointed that the list of the work group's proposed strategies doesn't include the development of a dedicated regional composting facility. In looking at Frederick County's report on composting from 2017, the estimated cost for a source separated organic compost facility was under $50 million. This is only a fraction of the 100 to $250 million estimated for the GBB proposed mixed waste processing facility. Moreover, there are many examples of existing composting facilities that demonstrate the ability to successfully divert 30 to 40% of waste stream from landfills and incinerators. Now, it's my understanding that mixed waste processing facilities have a track record of diverting less than half that amount of waste from landfills and, and incinerators. Furthermore, according to the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, composting employs two times more workers than landfilling and four times more workers than incineration. I urge the board to re reconsider and employ a strategy to build a regional source separated aerobic composting facility. This approach is good for our environment. It brings in more jobs. 
and costs a great deal less than a mixed waste processing facility. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Michelle. We appreciate your um, comments. Next, we have Ariel Smith. You're now unmuted. Hello, I'm a Baltimore County resident and I just wanted to thank you for this opportunity to, to speak. And the one thing that I was looking at in the plan was that I understand it's good that you plan to increase recycling, but I also wanted to focus on what's going to happen with that increase of recycling. As I have contacted the Solo Waste Work Group about one of the options that involve the France plants that possibly included incineration, which is actually bad for the environment. And while I was digging for information, I wasn't able to find any. And when I did contact the work group, they weren't able to give me anything outside of what they already presented. And so basically what I wanted to say is that you shouldn't be going in directions like this when considering how to deal with the extra recycling that's going to come out of this plan. And we should be considering options that have been well researched and that we fully know the environmental impact that they will have. Thank you. Thank you, Ariel. We appreciate your, your um, comments and feedback. Next, we have David True. Truax. Yeah, that's me. Hi. Truax. Hi You're now unmuted. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, everyone. Thanks for this opportunity. Thanks for doing this uh, very important work uh, that you're doing. Um, all the efforts that you've been doing, it, it's so important. Uh, so thank you. I, I know this isn't the most glamorous work uh, in Baltimore County, uh, but it's really important. So I, I can't thank you all enough. What I want to talk to uh, about tonight is something I'm very passionate about, and that's litter. Baltimore County has a litter problem. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but it's, you know, all the roads, um, it's, it's really, it's really terrible. Um, it's, it's embarrassing and it's unsanitary. So how does litter get on the road? People throw it out their windows or their car. Uh, people, uh, sometimes they're, they're recycling or their trash, the cans tip over, uh, and that's how litter gets out. Or sometimes it falls off the back of the truck. Uh, and anyway, it ends up on the sides of the roads. Uh, there's two ways that we need to, to uh, address this. Number one is we need to pick up the litter that's already there. Uh, and number two is we need to stop it uh, in, the, in the first place from getting into the hands uh, of those people that, that litter. Uh, the way to do that is the zero waste. Uh, you know, we need no more single use plastics uh, or severely cut down on single use plastics. We need compostable biodegradable alternatives. Uh, and, and again, that's really the only way that we're gonna solve this other than some kind of a statewide, um, you know, five cent bottle deposit or something like that. Um, again, it's, you know, cans, bottles, these things can be recycled, but they're not, uh, they're on the sides of the road. Um, Anyway, that's my two cents. I really appreciate all the work that you're doing. Uh, shout out to Councilman Patoka. I've uh, been working with him uh, for a, a couple years uh, on this. I really appreciate his, uh, uh, you know, his work on this and all of y'all's. Uh, so thanks very much. Thank you, David. We appreciate your um, feedback and uh, input and keep up the good work. Madam Chair. Yes, Madam yes, Chair. sir. Uh, could I just thank David, uh, Mr. Truax, for uh, he doesn't just talk the talk, he walks the walk. He frequently does cleanups uh, in the Park Heights area. Um, he also is a volunteer firefighter as well. So oh, he's out there trying to make our community stronger and safe and cleaner. So thank you, David. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're quite welcome, sir. Thank you, David. We appreciate all that you're doing. Next, we have Barry Nabonzi. Barry, you are now unmuted. Nabosni. Nabosni, thank you. Barry, Barry, are you with us? Mr. Nabosni, are you there? Okay, we can um, Madam Chair, back. Mr. Yes. Nabosny is a constituent uh, in the 2nd district, so I will follow up with him 
on this okay. call. On this he, if he wants to send his his comments uh, to the the email box, and if he's having technical difficulties, he can do that as well. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Savitra, the next uh, speaker. We have Thomas Six. All right, Thomas, you're now unmuted. Very good, thank you. Can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. Welcome. Wonderful. Welcome and thank you for uh, this opportunity. My name is Thomas Sisk. I operate and manage Eagle Transfer Services. Um, we are a family owned business that began as Hayden trash removal, transitioned to J&J &J trash removal, and now we are called Eagle Transfer Services. This month marks 42 years that we have been dutifully collecting Baltimore County solid waste and recycling. We are one of, one of your many haulers. I appreciate the current effort by this administration to develop recommendations that will keep Baltimore County sustainable. This type of forward thinking is needed, and I, I truly applaud it as a Baltimore County taxpayer. Um, however, I am concerned that some of the proposed changes could negatively impact both the haulers as well as the county. Specifically, if the routes are put out to bid, it is likely that many of our haulers would be adversely affected. But so would the county. Uh, because your current haulers are small family-owned businesses that work and pay taxes in the county, anything that negatively impacts them would trickle down to the county. We are local. We invest, we employ, and we thrive in Baltimore County. Many of us are second, third, and even fourth generation businesses that have created strong, lasting relationships in the community. We also have decades of experience on these routes, which is why some of us have the lowest complaint records in the area. That could not be duplicated by a revolving door bid system. And more importantly, let's not forget what we do for less. The data from local jurisdictions show that Baltimore County consistently spends trash, less on trash than any other counties in the area. By continuing to support us local waste management companies, the county has already developed a win-win situation. Mm -hmm. I do truly appreciate uh, letting me have this time to speak and uh, thank you for everything. You guys have a nice evening. Thank you so much. And we look forward to continuing to work with the uh, trash haulers. As I said earlier, our goal is to continue to work with you and have you at the table with us. So thank you for your service and we can look forward to continuing the dialogue. All right, next we have Jack Hayden. Ms. Mr. Hayden, you're unmuted. Okay, he's listed a couple of times. Let's see if it's the next one. There we go. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, okay, okay, very good. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, make comments tonight. Um, by background, I'm a county trash hauler, actually with Eagle Transfer. Uh, I've owned a landfill in Virginia, uh, and I've had a long haul tractor trailer company for transfer long haul with 150 trucks. Um, so that's a little bit of my background. Um, I applaud the county for recognizing the impending residential disposal shortage and studying the options. Um, I am very concerned that no real consideration is ever given to the commercial MSW disposal um, capacity in the marketplace or its current control slash monopoly by corporate waste companies. <clears throat> Commercial uh, waste is an is a issue for the county to consider also. As a longstanding Baltimore County residential hauler, I don't feel there is a real need or problem with the longstanding hauler franchise system. The haulers touch every Baltimore County resident at least once a week and give them good service. I think a mutually created service agreement with the current haulers would enhance the system. If consideration for a market-driven bidding system is ever considered, much consideration should be given to the livelihood of the current dedicated waste haulers that are currently picking up the trash. 
A 10-year period at a minimum should be allowed for such a transition with considerations for grandfathering the current haulers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hayden. Uh, I always appreciate hearing from you and continue to uh, uh, work with you and have uh, continue the dialogue. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Christy Demonopoulos. I think you're on mute for some reason. Am I on mute? You're off now, but you were. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, next. Okay, it looks like who we had next may have dropped off. Uh, so we're going to go to Carol Hedlund. Welcome, Ms. Hedlund. All right, you're now um, off mute. Okay, you can hear me. Thank you. Uh, Carol Hedlund, I live in Cockeysville. Uh, just moved there recently. Before that was in Towson, the heart of Towson. Um, and I'm also on the Green Sanctuary Committee at the Towson Unitarian Universalist Church. And one of the things uh, as our committee has been involved in, in uh, looking at ways to compost and also uh, working with a drawdown group on ways to reduce climate change. It's been very frustrating that the county uh, policies or rules say that residents can't compost food in their own backyard. So anything you can do to change that would be greatly appreciated. And um, the second point I'd like to make is I'd like to support all the comments that Jennifer Kunze made about um, how bad it would be to burn trash in any mixed waste processing facilities. And, and uh, I, I really think any of the solutions that involve trash burning should, should not go any further, um, it should be dropped. Thank you, that's all I have at this time. Thank you, Ms. Hedlund, appreciate your comments. All right, um, we're going to go back to Christy. Uh, she is still with us. Let's see. Okay, can you hear us? Yes, thank you. Thanks okay. for coming back to me. And what's Christy's last name, Savitra? Uh, it's Dem Demnowitz. Demnowitz, okay, yes. Thank you. No problem, thank you. Um, so my name is Christy Demnowitz. I'm the president of the Hawthorne Civic Association, and we're a community of 1800 homes over in Middle River. And we have a problem with illegal dumping here in our community. And there's also a problem with illegal dumping in the surrounding communities. And from what I've learned recently, it's a problem all across the county. Um, we started a petition to bring back bulk pickup to the county, which was uh, stopped in 1992 due to budget concerns. But the, um, the lack of bulk pickup in this county has led to increased illegal dumping that uh, needs to get you know, controlled or it's going to become more of a problem. We are a peninsula and there's always things like TVs and uh, one time an ATM, <laughs> which I understand wouldn't be taken by bulk pickup, uh, mattresses, sofas, furniture in our, along our shoreline. And um, the problem is only getting worse as the community and uh, people get older and more and more people have stuff that they can't get rid of. So with our petition, we have um, over 250 signatures from across the, the county uh, who are asking for bulk pickup to be returned quarterly at no cost to residents. Um, and they believe that it is something that we already pay, we should be uh, already paying for in our taxes, so it should not be at a cost to residents. Um, and hopefully this can be something that can be figured out with this solid waste plan. I like what was said earlier about some of the things being recycled, reused, repurposed, torn down to recycle the different parts like metal mattress springs and things like that. I think that's really important. But um, 
we just want to reiterate that the block pickup does need to be re-implemented or we're going to have a much larger problem in the future. And we're the only county in this area that doesn't offer it in some way or another. Uh, and the last thing I want to say is that we also support backyard composting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Madam Chair. Next. Yes, sir. Madam Chair. Uh, I just uh, wanted to uh, ask Christy what the name of her community association was again. Give me one moment. I have to unmute her. Sure, it's the Hawthorne Civic Association and it's Hawthorne, which is in Middle River. And the petition is at Hawthorne Civic Association dot com slash block pickup. If anybody wants to read it. I will read it. Thank you so much, Christy. Thank you. And I actually am the person that commented on your Facebook post about this as well. Okay, very good. Thanks so much, Christy. Thanks for thank coming you. out tonight or for joining us virtually today. Yeah, thank you all for doing this. It's appreciated. Sure. Okay, Savitra. Next, we have Dick Williams. You're now unmuted. Welcome, Mr. Williams. Okay, he must be having technical difficulty. Uh, next, we will have Patty uh, Mochelle. Mochelle. Mochelle, thank you. Uh, I think she must have logged off. Madam Chair, Patty Mochelle is with the Towson Green Alliance, and um, okay. I can reach out to her and get her comments as well. Sure, if they want to uh, send it to the website, anyone we missed or had um, technical difficulties, we will send an email back. We do have their email addresses. We can send it back and say that they can submit to the the um, email box. But Councilman uh, uh, Toka, if you want to uh, reach out, I'm sure that they'd appreciate that as well. Sure, thank you. So next right. we have Dante Swinson. Say you're unmuted. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, yes, so I've really appreciated uh, the conversations that's been going on through this discussion. I want to say that uh, this is based around the fact that the county made a major error in extending its contract with Willow Raider Baltimore for another six years, which runs counterintuitive to any engagement towards zero waste. Uh, additionally, having uh, the GBB and the Northeast Maryland Waste Disposal Authority involved, they typically lean towards uh, processes that involve incineration and any sort of mixed waste processing, and that's not great. Uh, you don't get as many high quality materials through mixed waste processing, and you ultimately end up with material that's just going to get burned, which is not sustainable. Uh, so there had been reference to building out a MRF uh, material recovery facility here uh, in the area which would be great if you built one the size of San Francisco's, it would cost about $41 million as referenced in that presentation uh, that could handle about 450,000 tons annually, which is twice as much as what the county is now committed to sending to the incinerator and twice as much as the amount that was suggested to be transferred from uh, the Eastern Sanitary Landfill. So it actually makes far more sense to build out the zero waste infrastructure than any sort of mixed waste processing facility. You also could build out a 120,000 ton uh, aerobic composting facility for about $13 million, still being way under the total of any sort of dirty MRF uh, or, or any sort of exports to other landfills or incinerators. Um, it's really important though, that we actually think about the uh, benefits of creating legislation that advocate for the creation of zero waste businesses within Baltimore County and the region that wasn't really underscored in this uh, aspect. And finally, I'll uh, reference San Francisco one more time in that they actually provided their residents with a 64 gallon recycling bin, a 32 gallon organic composting bin, and a 16 gallon uh -huh. trash bin. So to uh, change the visual of what is compostable and what is recyclable. I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, sorry, Swinton, have, your time is second, up. Three seconds. Uh, and it just gave everyone more space to throw out, but showed it was different. So that's all I had to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Swinson, for your comments. All right, next we have Larry Bannerman. 
Um, oh, okay. so Diane, I am a board member of the community group Turner Station Conservation Teams. A short while ago, you heard from my president, Gloria Nelson, we yielded her time. So if I go over by a few seconds, please uh, let me borrow some of those couple of seconds. Um, our community is a historic African American community. It's uh, Turner Station, Maryland. We live with pollution for 125 years, which is generations. Now we're seeing the effects of climate change firsthand. The justice aspect of environmental justice still loses us. We were quick to raise our hand when an opportunity to support offshore wind in Maryland arose. We testified at the Public Service Commission in Decatur, Maryland, and in Annapolis. That was eight years ago. There are no offshore wind turbines in Maryland. I say that again, there are no offshore wind turbines in Maryland. Not, but in 2019, Maryland paid $32 million to buy renewable energy credits from dirty energy sources. My father would say that's a sin on the shame. Now it's 2021, and we see the opportunity to bring some justice to the EJ front by ensuring that items that we send to be recycled are actually recycled and not burned and incinerated. We do celebrate the effort to close the wheel operator trash to energy facility that is right around the corner from another historic community, Westport, as well as Cherry Hill. They recently got rid of a coal burning power plant, but now they have the wheel operator pumping CO2 in them. And RPS tier one waste to energy language should be completely removed from any and all consideration going forward. The Turner Station Conservation Teams wholeheartedly support all comments and suggestions made by the group Clean Water Action regarding zero waste. Thank you very much. You guys have done a great job. Thank you so much. Madam Chair. Yes, sir. Uh, I just wanted to thank Mr. Bannerman for his uh, testimony and his comments. Uh, I would say, Mr. Bannerman, you're pretty much spot on. Thank you. Next, we have Caroline Eater. Caroline, just one moment and we'll unmute you. You're now unmuted. Hi, my name is Caroline Eater. Um, the work I do is the intersection of clean energy choices and zero waste. And I do deep dives into contracts, policies, and procedures. And I'd like to make one correction to start off with. The correct definition of zero waste can be found at the Zero Waste International Alliance. It is the only peer-reviewed definition of zero waste. And when somebody says you get to just kind of make up your own definition, I am very doubtful about their qualifications as a zero waste consultant. So I first want to thank um, Baltimore County for really looking forward in its vision. I read the bill that has been proposed for the study, a commitment to phase out incineration, a focus on recycling, reuse, composting, and advancing the principles of zero waste. So I support everybody ahead of me that talked about doing composting pay as you throw. That's where you're gonna get the biggest bang for your buck. I'd also like to explain a little bit about the mixed waste processing commonly known as a dirty MRF. What has come about is they only collect about a capture rate of 10 to 30%, which means the rest is just ugly, nasty, dirty slurry. Think if you have your nice piece of paper and your leftover salsa all mixed in with the cat litter, pretty nasty. It's end up that most of the time that is turning into a product to be burned. So this is basically incineration in another name. So this whole idea just needs to be scrapped because it is a burning process for $250 million. I agree with Mr. Miller to put the focus on upgrading your MRF to really making that, you know, uh, top of the line state of the art facility. And that's the way you want to go if you want to go zero waste. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Ms. Neighbor. Appreciate your response. Next, we have Gustavo Ballesteros. Uh, Gustavo, if you could please wait one moment and I will unmute you. 
You're now unmuted. Thank you and good evening. My name is Gustavo Ballesteros and I'm a high school senior interning at, at Clean Water Action. Over the past few months, I've been working on waste reduction initiatives across Maryland and wanted to share some recent legislation from Montgomery County. The County Council recently passed three bills aimed at reducing and diverting waste from the Dickerson incinerator and that may provide ideas for Baltimore County. Two of the laws established a waste reduction program to explore advancements in materials recycling, as well as prohibiting single-use plastic straws and number six polystyrene, both of which are unrecyclable in most facilities. The council also passed a zoning law which would allow more offsite material to be composted and mulched on farmland. These types of bills can encourage source separation, which places compostables in a separate bin for collection and delivery to several composting sites. Source separation can be more cost-effective than the current suggestion, to potentially sort out compostable materials from the waste streams in a large recovery facility. I encourage GPV and the work group to look into alternative composting collection methods and study how other Maryland counties are reducing their plastics and organic waste. Thank you again for letting me speak today. Thank you so very much for your um, comments. You're welcome. Next, we will have Marcus Moore. Marcus, if you just wait one moment and we will unmute you. I think Marcus may have left. All right, next we'll have Stephen uh, Spindler. Stephen, you are now unmuted. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to share my thoughts and opinions on the matter. I am Stephen Spindler Jr. and I'm the Vice President at Spindler Refuse Removal. I'm a third generation hauler for Baltimore County. My grandfather started collecting trash for the county in the 1960s. My grandmother, my parents, my aunts, uncles, and cousins were all at some point employed through Spindler Refuse. My family's trash hauling business has been a staple in this community for over 60 years. We truly are a family run mom and pop shop. Now I've taken over the reins and I'm looking to keep my family legacy going. Unfortunately, as I look forward, to the future, <clears throat> for the first time in over 60 years, there's an air of uncertainty. I acknowledge and understand at the rate we are going, changes need to happen for the sake of not only our landfills, but for our planet and our way of life. We need to be able to dispose of trash more efficiently, and we need to be able to recycle more effectively. I applaud the county executive for tackling this problem head on, instead of passing it along to the next administration. Actions need to be taken now. It seemed every hauler meeting that I attended always started the same. There wasn't enough room in the budget to give the haulers their annual two to three percent raise. Next, the county would bring up hauler performance of the previous year. Once all the residential complaints were tallied and the false or illegitimate, illegitimate complaints were rooted out, less than one percent of all complaints in the entire county were actually authentic. That number speaks volumes. That number tells me that each and every hauler does their job and does it exceptionally well. Yet, despite our excellent performance reviews year after year, there are talks of doing away with the current hauler program. The way I understand it is that there is no issue at all with the current hauler program. It seems to me that the issue lies within Baltimore County because previous administrations failed to educate the residents on what can and cannot be recycled and what can and cannot be thrown in the trash. I agree that changes need to be made, but we don't need to go outside the current hauler program to make these changes. We have always been willing to work with the county, and this time is no different. Given the chance, I believe that every hauler would change, adapt, and evolve to ensure the future of their business. We can make these changes together. Let's not stand divided. At Mr. The... Spindler, I'm yes. sorry, your time, your time is up. Okay, thank you. Mr. Spindler, thank you so much for your comments. But as I've said uh, several times throughout our process, we're fully committed to continuing to work with the current caller community and to find solutions going forward. This is not about putting uh, hollers out of business at all. I appreciate that. <clears throat> we do appreciate you um, uh, coming forward to express your concerns. Thank you. You are so welcome. Thanks, Mr. Spindler. All right, next we have Lorraine Howell. Lorraine, give me one moment and I will unmute you. You're now unmuted. Good evening. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. 
Um, I'm actually going to pass on any kind of a long statement because uh, Eagle Transport, Mr. Hayden, uh, Spindler, uh, they kind of uh, just said everything that I have basically was going to say this evening. So um, we are fourth generation haulers. We've been in this business for over 70 years, and we would certainly love to continue on for many years to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you All right, next we have Rob Wheeler. Rob, if you just wait one moment and I will unmute you. You're now unmuted. Thank you again, Rob Wheeler. I have been uh, the main representative of the Global Eco Village Network at the United Nations for many years. I participated in most of the UN sustainable development processes for 25 years, was one of the key organizers of the US Citizens Network on Sustainable Development and co led a county approved local agenda 21 plan and sustainable community campaign. I followed the development of weight processes and biological waste systems and streams for 45 years, and I live at the Heathcote community in Baltimore County. My first suggestion is that we forget about building a new waste incineration plant or contracting with another company for the use of one. It makes more sense to embed plastics and other disposables in products that will sustain the longevity of their use, such as pyrolysizing waste without oxygen to produce biochar, which can then be embedded in building materials and roadways, sequestering megatons of carbon at the same time. An associate of mine wrote an excellent book called Burn, Using Fire to Cool the Earth that describes how to do this, and I'll send information to you. We should also be transitioning to produce as much of our electricity and power from fully renewable sources of energy rather than burning parts of the waste stream. We also need to strive to transition as rapidly as possible to a fully circular, regenerative, and zero waste economy. Then we should be thinking about mining landfills if possible, instead of adding even more waste to them. The carts that were shown are for mixed material collection. I believe this using such a, a process drives down the percentage of waste that can be recovered versus pre-separation of recyclables, and I hope the county will look carefully into this. We, uh, building a new large mixed waste processing facility is not the way to go, especially if we're uh, already- I'm sorry, your time, I'm sorry, your time has expired. Thank you. All right, next. That was Mr. Wheeler, right? Yes. Rob Wheeler, okay, thank you. Next, we have Jim Johnson. Jim, if you just wait one moment while I unmute you, you're now unmuted. Well, good evening, Madam Chair, uh, Council Patoka, and task force members. I represent a multi-housing owner in Baltimore County of 7,500 units, just for uh, purposes of uh, understanding 500 dumpsters, if you will. Uh, we see the value in long-term um, solid waste disposal process and system. However, we are constantly and remain very concerned about additional fees and charges where they come in the form of enterprise fund use fees or otherwise. Uh, these may cause increased rents for our tenants and our affordable housing communities. Currently, we spend, uh, you probably well know, for multi-housing, there's one trash pickup, one recycle pickup per week that started in October of 2010. And we currently uh, pay for a second pickup at a cost of nearly $600,000 a year, nearly $60,000 for bulk trash pickup. Um, I'd like to switch to recycling at this moment. Um, despite the diligent efforts of our organization and frankly, the efforts of the county, we feel that our tenants have not fully embraced the recycling initiatives. Uh, we are opposed to any fines or penalties associated with this commingling of trash. And lastly, I wanna speak very briefly about, briefly about illegal dumping. Uh, despite signs, um, our private security, cameras, investigation, prosecution, is a pervasive problem. It's even gotten worse in 2020 with the amount of home construction and 
remodeling that's taken place. I would suggest the county invest in more investigative resources, as well as look at fines and penalties associated with dumping. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. All right, next we have Jan Miller. Jan, I believe you are now unmuted. Hi, uh, I'm a uh, proud Baltimore County Baywise certified grow homeowner. Unfortunately, I live in a high rat population neighborhood. I love the proposed food scrap composting and zero waste concepts but composting is not a feasible option for me. Will Baltimore County require Baltimore County Public Schools and other agencies to actively participate? From an educational perspective, it needs to start immediately to encourage neighbors and students to both recycle and have zero waste. The mention of litter, and I talk about illegal dumping. While providing pickup through the current or proposed methods, there will continue to be those intentionally dumping illegally on roads, parks, schools, businesses, and residential property. Often an underground economy of contractors provides landscaping or bulk pickup service, including going onto and into property to remove items as the residents are not capable of taking items to the curb. However, those contractors may not waste time driving to or paying fees to dump legally. Will Baltimore County actively pursue identifying and prosecuting illegal dumpers? No matter the source of funding, either general or enterprise, proposed trash pickup will not address illegal dumpers nor their innocent victims. Does this conclude your comment? Yes. Yes, it does. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Miller. Appreciate that feedback. All right. And for our final uh, commenter this evening is Jesse Keller. Jesse, just one moment and I will unmute you. All right. You are now unmuted. Are you still there? Jess, are you there? So I see that you are unmuted. You tried to. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, sorry about that. All right. Uh, well, thank you everyone um, for your time. My name is Jesse Keller. I'm with Maryland Multi Housing Association. We're a trade association of property management companies for rental housing communities. Um, our members manage over 210 rental housing homes across the state, including uh, 72,000 rental units in 272 uh, apartment communities in Baltimore County itself. Uh, we appreciate the work you all have been doing. Um, we've been monitoring uh, your meetings and efforts. Um, and we appreciate, um, like I said, your efforts to modernize um, Bal uh, Baltimore County's trash collection infrastructure. Um, and we are here to um, offer ourselves as a resource. And um, we are happy to connect you with our residents as well as our owners on what programs would work best for uh, trash infrastructure improvements. Uh, we did want to mention that um, we're, and again, happy to work with you on resident education initiatives. We think there could definitely be some improvements um, with resident education on trash and recycling collection. Um, and we also wanted to mention that Unfortunately, we're not immune to the challenges that the financial challenges that our members have been facing during the COVID pandemic um, and delinquency rates have been really uh, skyrocketing in our communities over the past year while um, usage communities and other costs have continued to go up. So 
if there are major changes to the trash collection infrastructure, um, we ask that these um, costs not be borne to our members and thus ultimately passed on to residents. Um, but we look forward to working with you and again, for your creative solutions on illegal dumping and um, separating recycling and uh, recycling contamination fees, which impact our members. Um, so thank you for your time. And just thank you for um, listening in to all of our meetings and uh, when you couldn't um, following up and reviewing the notes and the the, the um, recorded uh, tapes. We appreciate that and we look forward to um, talking with you further. And thank you for your time and for um, always being so quick to respond and email to me. So thank you. All right, um, so this concludes our public comment period. Uh, if anyone experienced technical difficulties uh, or was unable to provide comment just due to scheduling or another um, barrier, we will reach out to you via email and provide instructions on how you could provide a written comment. Um, at this time, I would like to turn it over to our chair to provide us with closing remarks. Oh, Madam Chair, you're on mute. Sorry, I hadn't done that all night. Um, keeping a tally of our, our uh, presenters by name, did we lose some folks along the way? Yes, so there were 24 individuals who either experienced technical difficulties, had logged on and had logged off by the time we got to them, um, or had not joined. Okay, so what um, for work group members, what we will do for the balance of those individuals, because we did have 49 individuals and we either uh, received comments from 31 tonight. Um, with the exception of two individuals uh, that Savitra called who did not um, respond. But all of them will receive an email indicating if they have any comments to please send them uh, as soon as possible to our um, county website, I mean, the county email box. And if we should get any other comments, we'll make sure that you get them uh, so that you can um, take them into consideration uh, as you're doing your homework on the um, priority uh, poll documents on the 19 recommendations. Um, we, we, we did uh, hear from quite a few individuals with very insightful uh, information, which has given me some other ideas um, of things that we may need to consider, especially the residential multi-dwelling housing part in terms of the, the education uh, piece, not just to our um, homeowners, but to uh, individuals who live in multi-housing dwellings, because we have to look at, at that whole aspect of this work. Okay. Um, um, Council Member uh, Kotoka, do you have any uh, closing remarks? Uh, for the team or any of our, our work group members, any questions before we adjourn this evening? And um, Jennifer will be providing you with your, your link and also the follow-up uh, information as to um, how we should complete our homework. I just want to say thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to all of the uh, work group members. Thanks to the participants. This has uh, been um, a comprehensive and collaborative process, and I appreciate everyone rolling up their sleeves and digging in on this. Thank you. Um, okay, um, Jennifer, any last words uh, for or instruction for work group members uh, before we? Um, uh, I see uh, Christy D. See, so that was she was taken care of. We went circled back to her on the two. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. She All right, that was 708. I'm sorry. I'm in the no, time. We got, right. we got that on her. 
No, just to say, I'm going to uh, forward everyone the link and also the final uh, PowerPoint used tonight. So thanks to everybody for all your time and effort. It's really been wonderful being part of this. Okay, so we'll get an e get an email, but we'll also get a reminder of um, your submitting uh, your your feedback by Wednesday close of business. Correct? Wednesday correct. close the of 10th. business. The tenth. I know that gives us homework over the weekend, but we really want your feedback, especially any written concerns or or like we were talking about pros and cons. Uh, adding that in the narrative. Um, as we go forward and taking into consideration no comments we heard this evening from the members of the public. All right, thank you all. It's been my pleasure uh, to work with you and we will be communicating and writing to you with respect of, of the drafts and also um, the, the aggregate feedback for the 19 recommendations once we get it all in. Correct, Jennifer? That's true. All right, so the rest, the remainder of our uh, communications will be via email. And I don't think we have uh, any other in person recommendations, just forwarding everyone uh, copies of the documents. Yeah. All right, thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Okay. Good night. Bye bye. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, GBB. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye.